Amen. You guys can be seated. If you have your Bibles, which I really hope you do, uh, we will be looking in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 this morning, and we'll be looking at the first three verses. Um, I, if, like I said earlier, if some of you may be trickling in. Uh, my name is Michael Page. I'm the lead pastor here at Connection Church Savannah, and we are glad you're here. Um, and something that really just stuck out to me this morning is we're starting a brand new series. Um, if it's your first time here, it's a great first Sunday for you to be here. Um, and I want to encourage you to come back for the next four Sundays after this, uh, just to kind of hear the entirety of the sermon series, because we're starting a new sermon series series today called Re-Engage. Um, and our heart today is that as a believer in Christ, as someone who says, hey, I believe in Jesus and I'm following Jesus, I pray this morning that you would understand what it means to follow Jesus. Because sometimes, especially in the context of the American church, we give Jesus lip service, but not life service. Does that make sense? And sometimes we have this, this mentality of where we come before Jesus and we'll sing songs about uh, uh, chains fall, fear bow. Here now, Jesus, you change everything. Uh, lives healed and hope found. Here now, Jesus, you change everything. But sometimes we don't give him the authority in our life to change the things that he needs to change in us. And so our heart today is that we would be re-engaged with Jesus. And that, that's the first week of this series is being re-engaged with Jesus. And so what we're looking at is our, our cultures of our church. Our cultures of our church is who we are, the identity. If you cut us, we should bleed the DNA of community, serving, generosity, and evangelism. That's the four cultures of our church. We believe that if you're growing in those four areas of the church, you are growing in your relationship with Jesus. And we believe that you're being effective in the world around you. You're being an effective member of the body of Christ. And so this morning, I pray that we would just dig in um, into those cultures. This morning, we would dig into what Jesus is trying to do in our personal lives, but also collectively as a church, and that we would have a deeper investment, not only with the big C church, but also with this context of this local body of Connection Church. And our hearts would be that we would love one another, be unified, and see the nations reach with the gospel this morning. So... When I say the word re-engage this morning, when I say be re-engaged with Jesus, you may say, well, Michael, I don't really feel like I've ever disengaged, right? Um, you know, I don't, no, I've never really disengaged from Jesus, but this past year has been a pretty difficult year, 2020 and then 2021. It just seems like things just keep coming. It was a, 2020 was a year filled with distraction and isolation and uncertainty, and it just keeps coming and coming and coming. And these things that we've never had to endure before, we've had to endure, Right? With things we've never had to face before, we face. And, and what, what happened in this past year, year and a half, is you'd think that people would have been more engaged with their relationship with Jesus. But as I studied statistics this week, I was blown away by how in a year, the church should have drawn near to God, actually moved away from God instead. I looked at some of the statistics of the average Bible study, personal Bible study and prayer time dropped significantly. Um, only 35% of, listen to this. Only 35% of the people who left the church to quarantine are still attending their pre-COVID church. 35%. 50% of millennials have stopped attending church altogether. 26% of the baby boomers, same, same statistic. 35% of Generation X, same statistics, have, have stopped attending church altogether. And so over the next five weeks, what I want to do is to challenge you through the word and to engage in your, not only your relationship with Jesus like never before, but also with what God is calling you to do in your life and to us, for us to do collectively as a church. And I always want to be a church that fights to engage and stay engaged with the mission of God no matter what we face in life. That has to be our goal. No matter what we face, no matter what we find, that's the goal. Because if we look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12, the whole book of Hebrews is written to the persecuted church. To keep going. Jesus is king. Look to him. He's the one that will sustain you. He's the one that will push you forward. That is what we're looking at today. And so this morning, if you have your Bibles, I want to pray. And uh, we're going to look in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. So Lord, we love you. I thank you for who you are, what you've done through Jesus. I pray this morning that the gospel will be put on display clearly, Father, that people would come to know you, Father, through saving faith in you, Jesus. But also, I pray that Christians in this room who have been disengaged, who have been uh, just isolated, who have been just out of the game or on the sidelines, would just be reignited in their relationship with Jesus, you, Jesus, that you would just wake us up as a church, God, that we would be on fire for you, Lord, on fire for your mission, that we would see a harvest of people coming to know you, Jesus, that you would start a revival in this place, God, not only in this place, but the big C church across the world, Lord, that you would be made famous, God, that your glory would go out into the earth, and we would see multitudes of people praising the name of Jesus. 
I pray this morning that you would do your work in our lives. God, don't let your word return void. God, I pray that hard hearts would be softened. God, I pray that hurt hearts would be healed. God, I pray that brokenness would be restored. God, just do your work in this place. Don't let us leave this thing. God, don't let us leave lethargic, lazy Christians. God, wake us up in Jesus' name. Amen. God, we, we, we just, I love this place. I love this church. I love the body of Christ in general. Um, this morning, we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 12. Um, and let's read verses 1 through 3 together, and then we'll kind of dissect it. Is that cool? Yeah. All right, cool. It says, therefore, we're going to look at why that therefore is therefore in a minute. Since we also have such a large crowd of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside. Some versions of this say, throw off. Every hindrance and the sin that so easily entangles or ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that lay before him. He endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, that's huge, a circle, consider him. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. And so for some context this morning, the reason why it says, therefore, he, you look back at chapter 11. Chapter 11 has just been rolled out to us, and some good Baptists in the room know that chapter 11 is called the Hall of Faith, right? Some of y'all, some of y'all know, right? Okay, all right, listen, guys, can't, I can't, can't, you know, I can't, I, I can't help it. So verse, verse 17 of chapter 11, I just want to read, blow through some of this. It's not going to be on the screen. If you have your Bible, it's one page back. Um, verse 17, it literally says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He received promises, and yet he was offering this one and only son, the one to whom it was, had said, your offspring will be called, will be called through Isaac. He considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead. Therefore, he received him back, figuratively speaking. Verse 20, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of his sons and Joseph, and he worshiped, leaning on the staff, on top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, as he was nearing the end of his life, mentioned the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, after he was born, was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw that the child was beautiful and they didn't fear the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people to God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. For he considered reproach for the sake of Christ to be greater wealth than the treasure of Egypt since he was looking ahead to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt behind, not being afraid of the king's anger for Moses per persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. By faith, he, the, he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch the Israelites. By faith, they crossed the Red Sea as though they were on dry land when the Israelites, excuse me, when the Egyptians attempted to do this, they were drowned. And it goes on and on and on. The whole chapter is by faith, by faith, this, by faith, this person persevered, by faith, this person was delivered, by faith, this person did something in the face of danger and fear that nobody should have been able to do, but, but by faith, Jesus, by faith, God, by faith, these people were, were delivered, these people were endured, these people saw the reward. And this morning, as you're reading this, the author of Hebrews is saying, here's what faith has looked like in the past. And he's saying, just as they ran their race, I'm urging you to run your race. And so this morning, if you're in here and you're saying, hey, Michael, I'm a Christian. I follow Jesus. Like my heart is that you would see that we're called to run a race. And as you think about this idea of being engaged with Jesus or re-engaging with Jesus, I want us to think in athletic terms, right? Some of you are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Athletics, not for me, right? I want you to think in athletic terms here for a second because not that you're performing for your salvation because your salvation has nothing to do with you but who you put your trust in, right? But once you're saved and God has filled you with the Holy Spirit, God has called us to run a race that he's marked out for us. First Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says it this way. Do you not know that in a race, all of the runners run? but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I pre preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Discipline. Discipline. Discipline in the Christian faith. And so, 
How do we run this race effectively? And so I want to give you three things like any good uh, pastor would do, give you three things to kind of look at um, this morning uh, as you look at this. I want to look back at verse 1. It says, therefore, since we, have, since we also, we also, as us too, not just Abraham and Moses and Noah and Sarah and Jacob and Esau and Isaac and all these people, not just those people, but we also have a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. So the writer of Hebrews, no one knows for sure who wrote it, but the writer of Hebrews, if you look at it, he's, he's lumping us in as Christians with the fathers of our faith, right? He's saying your brother Abraham, your brother Isaac, your brother Moses, your sister Sarah, we are in the same boat as followers of God and followers of Jesus in this moment. So that's what we have to get our minds around here. And so he says, we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. And so this is speaking about in terms of people who have gone before us, who are cheering us on in our faith. But this also, I feel like, means that we are called to surround ourselves with people as we run. That's the first point. Surround yourself with people. As you're following Jesus running this race, you will not be able to do this without surrounding yourself with people. Next week, the topic we're going to be discussing is going to be talking about community. We're going to touch on it today, but we're going to dig in next week. Who knows in this room that community is important, right? A few of us, okay? I hope by next week, everybody will know, right? So the first point is surround yourself with people. I want to tell you, you will not get very far in this race without people around you. You won't. Calling you to keep God's promises to, in close proximity. Reminding you to, to be faithful in the face of struggle. And sometimes people enter a community and they think, I need to get something from somebody. I need somebody to, to pour into me. But more and oftentimes than not, God calls you into community to give something, not to receive something. And our heart is, as we're giving, God would give back to us it, a, a hundredfold. I've seen it a hundred times in groups that I've been a part of. So as you're joining groups, as you're a part of community, give yourself to that group. Don't just associate yourself with those people because association doesn't get you anywhere. What we're seeing in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews is showing us a connection between community and endurance. You see this? He's showing us a connection between community and endurance. And endurance, community and spiritual strength, right? And so if we want to engage with Jesus, if we want to have an intimate relationship with Jesus, I'm just guessing if you're here today that you're saying, you know, Michael, I have at least somewhat of an interest in a relationship with Jesus, right? Somebody, everybody here should probably say that because it's why you're here. I don't, care, I don't care if somebody drug you here or you just happen to drive by and say, oh, there's a church, I'm going to go there. You want to be connected to an intimate relationship with Jesus. But the thing that distracts us, the thing that divides us usually is our, our, our lack of effort or our lack of commitment and investment into the body of Christ. And so as you're reading this this morning, we're called to surround ourselves and invest in healthy community because that's vital. If you're not in healthy community, it's going to be hard for us to survive as a Christian. And on the opposite side of that, as I'm reading Hebrews chapter 12, this is also showing us that there's a connection with isolation in our faith. Oh, I can do this by myself. I'm just going to keep watching church from home on the couch. I'm going to kind of just do my own thing. I'm going to kind of do this. My own. I don't trust anybody at the church because the church hurt me one time. I can't trust anybody, right? We got isolated. What happens Isolation. People who isolate themselves in their faith are one step away from giving up. Right? You see, you show me a person who isolates themselves from community, and I'll show you a person who is moments away from shipwrecking their faith. I'll tell you, I mean, I'm telling you right now that I've seen it in my own life. Isolation in the Christian faith is spiritual suicide. It's quiet in here right now. You know what I'm saying? It's, like, it's true. We're created to do life together. A connection, we have a value statement around our culture of community. We say, we believe that community is where real life change happens. We believe real life change happens in the context of doing life together. We believe as you do life together, you're changed and you're, you're made new. We can look over in Acts chapter 2. Y'all know y'all are getting through a culture series like going through Acts chapter 2. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, that's the church, to the breaking of bread, that's considered communion here, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together, community, and held all things in common. They sold their possessions, generosity, and property and distributed the proceeds to all who had need. 
Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number daily. So we live in community. We live out community in a healthy way and people are drawn to Jesus. As I'm looking at this verse, what I'm seeing is they were de- the church was devoted to the word of God. They were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to the breaking of bread, to gathering together. They were devoted to prayer. And this is what church is all about. This is what church is all about. This, the church is not a, I say this all the time, the church is not an event to attend on your calendar. The church is a family to belong to. It's not something that you just do in your free time or when you have a free weekend or whenever you feel like you need, this, you need some Jesus in your life, you just show up and you get some Jesus and you go home. That's not what this, the church is about. The church is investing your life into people, giving yourself to people and they give themselves to you and you build one another up and you love one another and you go out on mission together, investing in one another, showing the community what Jesus looks like because you alone is not a very good picture of Jesus. But us together is a good picture of Jesus. It's a family to belong to. Listen, church gatherings and connect groups, they aren't something you put on your weekly schedule like you can move around when it's convenient. It's a family that you belong to and invest in. The Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25 talks about, let us consider ways that we can spur one another along in the faith. That means I'm thinking about ways that I can encourage you. I'm thinking about ways that I can spur you along in your faith. I'm thinking about ways, how can I help my brother grow? How can I help my sister grow? I'm thinking about ways, how can I help this church grow and move? Who has a good imagination? Anybody? One, two people? Okay. So imagine, if you need to, if you need to close your eyes, you can. Just don't fall asleep, right? I want you to imagine for a second that you're in a connect group at Connection Church Savannah, right? Uh, some of you, this might be a stretch. I don't know. But imagine that you're in a connect group with Abraham, with Moses, with Joshua, with Paul, with Peter. Imagine for a second that you're in a connect group surrounded by these heroes of your faith that you're actually brothers and sisters with. The same level, right? Same spirit. Every week on one side of the circle, you have Abraham. Abraham was a man of faith. Right? Anything God told him to do, he was willing to do it. Could you imagine being in a connect group with Abraham? You start, you start sharing, you know, I just, I'm struggling to read my Bible. I'm struggling to, 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 I'm struggling to find time to go to church. I'm struggling to find time to pray. You know, what would Abraham say? What would he say? How would he encourage you in that moment? He would say, okay, I'm going to try to stay calm. How could you live any other way than all out surrender to God? How could you know the truths of this book and live any other way but completely sold out, giving your life to Jesus, giving your life to the church, giving your life to see his kingdom come and built, unified in this place? Imagine hearing about Moses this week, right? Moses, it's share time, right? Everybody got share time. How's your week been, Moses? Everything good? He was like, well, my people were enslaved and God sent me to my people with this staff and told me to set his people free. I was kind of of intimidated, but I knew he was going with me. So I stuck my staff in the dirt and the seas parted and they were delivered on dry ground. I'd be like, Moses, let's be real for a second, bro. I would be so encouraged at that moment. God did what now? what, What happened? Like, I'd be sitting there with my mouth open, like, what? I want to experience some of that, Moses. Like, how did that happen, you know? Let me hold that staff for the weekend, right? (laughs) Can you imagine? Can you imagine for that moment what kind of faith that you would receive in that moment of Moses sharing his testimony with you of what God's done in his week? Can you imagine that? Next up, you have Joshua. Joshua's sitting there with his army clothes on because he was an awesome general, right? He was, he's sitting there with his armor on. You know, you can think about this. He says, Joshua, how's, how's your week been, man? He says, well, I'm learning to listen to God. He, he, what he says, I'm learning to listen to him and do what he says. God sent me to Jericho and he said, march around the building, which was a shot to my pride because I'm a, I'm a dang good general. I can take a city like this. I've taken many cities for the Lord, but this time he said, march. March around the city. I look silly. But he said, March, and it didn't make sense, but I did it. But what I've learned about life is life's not about me and what I can do. It's not about how many cities I can take. It's about me being faithful to what God's called me to do. Life is about listening to God and doing what he said, even when it's hard and doesn't make sense. And then you come to Paul, right? Remember, this is an every week meeting for you. <laughs> Think about this. This is your connect group. 
Come to Paul. This is you're, you, you're, you're, you're strange spiritually. You don't feel like you're growing that much. And Paul comes in and he says, hey, man, what are you doing? Where are you putting your trust? Where are you, why are you putting so much pressure on yourself? Why are you trying to perform for God? And he says, you know, I've, I've been caught up in this religious system before where I've tried to check every box and basing God's love on how much I can do for him or how good I can be. And Paul said, that's not what it's about. I, I count everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I might gain Christ. And, he's, and he, he speaks and I obey. Guys, how would that encourage you? Listen to Paul, listen to Moses, listen to Abraham talk to you. And then comes Peter. This is my boy. He said, listen, boy, I'm just going to be straight up with you. This is Peter, right? Rough on the edges. I've done some stupid things in my life. How many of us can relate? <laughs> All of us. I've done some stupid things in my life, but God does amazing things with stupid, messed up people, right? God does some amazing things with sinful people. Jesus takes messed up people and does amazing things with them. Could you imagine walking out of that connect group every week? You would not be like, okay, now on to the next thing. Okay, now I got to take my kids to school. Tomorrow I start school. Okay, next week I got to do this. Okay, tonight. No, you would be so encouraged. You would not be struggling to, to read your Bible. You'd be begging God to do something incredible in your life. Like you've just heard your brothers and sisters had God had done something in their life. You'd be so fired up. You'd be invested in that group. You could not wait to go back. And this is what God is calling us to in community. This is what God has a design community to happen. But so many of us are living isolated where it's, it's, it's either complete isolation or emotional isolation where you don't allow anyone to see the real you or do life with you. You may give them a, a facade of who you're, you want to be. You may give them a fake version of you, but you don't give them the real you. Because I don't trust the church. I don't trust people because I've been hurt or burned before. Our heart is that we would trust Jesus for that. And that isolation will kill you, man. God wants us to be in community of people who can spur us on. My question for you this morning is who are you surrounding yourself with this morning? Who are you surrounding yourself with this morning? Are they people that push you on to be more devoted to God? Or are they people who draw you into complacency? Anybody knows what complacency is, right? You're just kind of getting by. You're doing your thing. You're not really, you're not really hot or cold. You're lukewarm. Is the people that you have around you drawing you into complacency? Are they spurring you on to faith and good deeds and good works? Because there's a disease in the Bible Belt that says that you can love God and stay the same. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It says that just keep doing what you're doing, sustain, be nominal, be a lukewarm Christian. You can't wait to die and go to heaven, right? You raise your hand, you pray a prayer, you move from the line going to hell to the line going to heaven, but not much else changes. That's all it is. And that's, that's, that's not the way the Bible describes faith. That's not the way the Bible describes faith. You look at the lives of Abraham and Moses and Joshua and Paul and Peter, and you'll see that our faith is described as red hot devotion and investment to Jesus and his people. And this morning, I want you to see that God wants you to grow. He wants to grow us up and use us in the context of his church so that people will see Jesus through us, not me or not you, but us together. And for us to look more and more like Jesus it has a lot more to do with who you surround yourself with. My grandma used to say all the time, you show me who you surround yourself with, and I'll show you who you're, you know, who you're becoming, who you're becoming like. And so what do you surround, who are you surrounding yourself with? Is it people who are spurring you on, people who are leading you into complacency, or people who are leading you astray? This morning, where do you stand? The second thing I see in Hebrews chapter 12 is this, is to help us re-engage with Jesus this morning is it says, fix your eyes. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Some versions say keeping your eyes on Jesus. And I want to tell you this morning, there's probably not much more important things that I can share with you than this. If I were to give you like my last words or if I was leaving or dying, I would say keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Christ. It says this in verse 2. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. Some say author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat at the right hand of the throne of God. So the source, he started it. The perfecter, the work he started in our life, he will finish. Philippians 1, chapter 6 says, He who started a good work in you will bring it on to completion until the day of Christ. That's good, right? 
If Jesus started a good work in you, guess what? He will finish it. The pressure is not on you. The pressure is not on me. The pressure is on him and his work through the spirit in our life. The problem is, are you quenching the spirit as he tries to move and guide and lead you? Are you saying yes to Jesus? Are you saying no? Are you saying not yet? Are you fearful? All we have to do is get out of the way. I mean, I get in the way of Jesus' work in my life a lot. I'm like, God, I don't know. Listen, the gospel message is not be better so you'll be saved. That's not, the gospel message is not, all right, clean this up and then God's gonna love you. Go over here and fix your life up and then God's gonna love you. That's not the gospel message. The message of the gospel is fix your eyes on Jesus and rest the weight of your life on his finished work on the cross, yielding to the Spirit's work in your life. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. It's not, you need to fix yourself up and then come to Jesus. Fix yourself up and then start serving. Fix yourself up and then start being a part of a community because nobody's going to like you because you're pretty messed up. Let me tell you something. 10 out of 10 people in this room are messed up. Okay? 10 out of 10 people in this room are prideful and arrogant and selfish. Okay? We all struggle with that because we're human. We have a sinful nature. We're called to do life together, real life together, not fake life together. We're called to submit, bend our knee to Jesus, and watch him work in our life because that's what's going to happen in a connector. When you bend your knee to Christ, he starts working in you, through you, and, and out of you, and you start saying, I'm not sure how this is working, but God is doing this. Can you imagine the moment wherever Moses put the stake in the ground and the seas parted? I'm not sure if I know what to do in that moment. Like, what is happening? Like, this is God, obviously, but think about just the amazingness of that moment. Think about the Israelites being encouraged, like, our God is the true God. Yahweh is the true God. He can do the same thing through us. So you see the difference. A lot of us are coming out of religious backgrounds. I know I did. Religion says, this is about you. This is about you, how you can clean your life up, how you can do better. The gospel says, this is about Jesus and what he can do through you. What does that look like? This looks like two things. The first thing in, in chapter, or chapter 12, verse 1b, it says, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. It says some versions say throw off. I want to use the word throw off. You fix your eyes on Jesus. The, the way that you do this is you throw off everything that ensnares you. I think we have a point maybe coming up for you. Nope. Okay. I was hoping. Nope. All right, cool. So it says throwing off anything and everything that hinders our relationship with Jesus. Throwing off anything and everything that hinders our relationship with Jesus. When I said that, something came to your mind that's hindering your relationship with Jesus right now. It may be a job that you need to quit. You're like, wait, 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 wait. It might be a relationship that you're in, not marriage, a relationship that you're in that you need to get out of. It may be a friendship that you need to remove yourself from because it's hindering your walk with Jesus. It may be something that, it may be, it can be anything. Throwing off anything. And then he says, throw off any sin that may be, that, that you may be justifying. Who likes to justify sin? I do. I, I mean, it's not that bad. You know what I mean? I can get, you know, God loves me, right? No. He wants us to throw off the sin that we justify. Because you notice right here how he differentiates between these two things. Things that are hindering us. And things that were walking in sin and the sins ensnared us. You see the two things? So what he's saying, listen up, please. What he's saying is just because we're not falling into some deep, dark sin like adultery or murder or something crazy in our life, it doesn't mean that there aren't things in your life that may be morally okay, but they're hindering our spiritual growth. Do you see that? So what, what's hindering you this morning? What's hindering your relationship with Jesus? It didn't have to be sin. It doesn't have to be sin. Most likely, this is probably a good thing that's become a main thing in your life. Think about this for a second. It could be comfort. I love comfortable things like couches and movie theaters and like air conditioner. Thank God for that, man. You know what I mean? I love those types of comfort and security. It's not a bad thing, but when comfort gets, the, the gets the, in the way of you obeying God, it's sin. If comfort's in the way of you saying yes to a, be a missionary or plant a church or go overseas for the rest of your life, then comfort is your enemy. Comfort becomes a sin. The list goes on. It could be money. I got to make more money. I got to make more money. I'm doing whatever it takes to make more money. I may be outside the, the will of God, but God understands and he's going to do, he's going to continue to bless me even though I'm outside of his will. Guys, that's a lie from the American church culture. 
I'm telling you this morning, that's a lie. It could be hobbies. I'm not, is your hobby getting you outside of God's will? Are you going to play ball on Sundays instead of meeting with the church? Like, what are you doing that's understand that, that you need to see that these things may not be bad things? It could be family. It could be social media. It could be Netflix binges that you're on. It could be vacation. It could be anything that you're putting before God that's hindering your walk with him and your growth with him. Because these things aren't in themselves bad, but when they become a hindrance in your relationship with God and keep us from maturing in faith, we're called to throw them off aggressively. There's a pastor, there's an old pastor, his name is J. Wilbur Chapman. He says, my life is governed by this rule. Anything that dims my vision of Christ or takes away my taste for Bible study or cramps my prayer life or makes Christian work difficult is wrong for me. And I must, as a Christian, turn away from it. So when you read this, guys, throw it off. This is not gentle language. This is pretty aggressive language here in Hebrews. This is the attitude that we become. We come against these things that are distracting us away from Jesus, and we aggressively throw them off. So what sin in your life? What sin in your life? Those are the things that hinder you. What sin in your life may be entangling you? The Bible talks about sin luring you in by your own desires and lies to you, entices you, and then it entangles you. I'll tell you this this morning, that sin always leads to destruction. It may not be now. It may be later. Sin always leads to destruction. What sin in your life has the tendency to destroy your witness and entangle you this morning? You know what it is. You're probably thinking about it right now. I know I am. I always ask myself, I write this in my journal from time to time, I ask my friends this, if Satan were to trip you up tomorrow, what would he use to trip you up? What would he use to to knock you off your way? What would he use? It could be anything. The writer of Hebrews shows us that sin will entangle us and destruction is imminent and that he says, don't play around with it, he says, throw it off. The second way that you do this is you run the race. You run the race. Guys, this is the main point of this text. As you read this, it says, run with endurance. The author assumes that the race will be long. I hate running, right? Okay, I, if I'm running, you better run, okay? That's how it goes. If you, don't ask questions because if Michael's running, there's a problem, okay? And so I don't like running. I'm out of shape. I, I, it just doesn't feel good, okay? Let me tell you, running a marathon is probably one of my worst nightmares. It's a long time. To be running, okay? And so this is not a sprint. I like sprints because they're short and they're done, right? But sometimes I treat my relationship with Jesus like a sprint. Many times I've treated a church plant like a sprint. And God reminded me, if you treat this like a sprint, it will destroy your life and kill you. This is an endurance race. The best way to run this race is not by focusing on your performance, but focusing on, on what Christ has already done. That's how we focus on this race. So how do we do this? A lot of people spend their entire Christian life thinking about the big moments. When's the next men's retreat? When's the next if gathering? What's my next big step that I can celebrate? What's the next big thing that I can get involved in or the next spiritual high that I can inject into my spirit and just love Jesus even more? We think about the big spiritual highs. Is what we, it's kind of how we base our, our walks with Jesus on sometimes, guys. But the race is not won in the big moments. The race is won in the small moments, the daily disciplines we create in our lives, the constant, consistent rhythms that we create in our lives. I hate that. <laughs> I want to live for the big moments where all the men are at the men's retreat. We're, we're singing Kumbaya and hugging each other and slapping high fives and playing Corfo and all these things that y'all know about that happens at the men's retreat. You know what I mean? I want to live for those moments, right? It's not weird, I promise. But you may say, man, I don't have time for stuff like that. I don't have time to do all these things. I'm busy. I have two jobs and seven kids. And, but, but let me tell you, listen, let me tell you, we all are busy. I want to just bust your bubble for a second. We all have busy schedules, right? Yeah, we all do. We all need to make more space for God. We all do. Where you spend your time, treasure, your talent, and your energy will show you what the most important things in your life really are. 
You can say, I love Jesus as much as you want. You can sing his praises and read your Bible as much as you want. Unless you're invested in him and his church, you would never, ever, ever convince me of anything different that you worship yourself and not him. And my heart today is that we will be a church that gives our all to Jesus. Some of us need to have our schedules blown up and resubmit them to God. I used to try, I used to, try to quit something every Thursday. I was, I, was, I was encouraged to do that one time by an author of a book I was reading. He tries to quit something every Thursday. I'm like, how do I, how do I, how do I do that? That's, uh, what am I supposed to quit? You know, there's so many things that I that I that I value. There's so many things that I try to do. My, and my heart today is that we would understand that if you have a job that's getting in the way of your relationship with Jesus, you need to quit it. If you have a if you have a uh, a, a relationship in your life that's keeping you from God or keeping you from growing, you need, you need to separate yourselves in those moments. If you have something that's and that's the sin in your life, you need to destroy it. Kill the sin. Guys, if we want to run this race well, we have to be willing to cultivate some consistent rhythms that keep our eyes on Jesus in a world full of distractions. If we want to re-engage with Jesus, we have to come to the point where we're willing to kill anything that's not our ally in following Jesus because he's the only one that matters. So if we want to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, we have to throw off the things that hinder us. We have to throw off the sin that entangles us and kill it. And we have to be willing to run the race. Our heart this morning is that we would all be in that place. And lastly, if we want to stay engaged with Jesus, we have to remember the gospel. Remember the gospel. Some of you guys this morning may be sitting here, oh, I know the gospel. I know I, that's how I got saved. I heard the gospel. I, I, you know, I, I responded to the gospel and now I'm saved and we're good to go. All this stuff, you know. Guys, you never get past the gospel. If you come to this church, we talk about the gospel every week. We want to talk about the gospel. We want to highlight the gospel. We want to rejoice over the gospel. We want to, we want to give it to you over and over and over again. My, the main thing in my job description as a pastor is to remind you of the gospel over and over and over and over and over again until eternity, until I die. Remind you of what Jesus has done on the cross. Remind you that you don't have to live the life that you think you're called to live. Remind you that you need to press into Christ. What it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, B, it says, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God on the throne of God. It says, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. Guys, some of you may be sitting in church and have given up. You can still come to church and go to connect group and have given up. Just going through the motions, being a lukewarm, nominal Christian, sitting on the sidelines. My heart today is that we would reconnect with Jesus. The main way that you're going to do that is remembering the gospel. A huge word. If you have your Bible, circle, underline, highlight, consider him. This is how we remember the gospel. Consider Jesus. It's huge. Think about Christ. Meditate on Christ. Keep our eyes fixed on Christ because it's the gospel that points us to Jesus. And it's the gospel that fuels the Christian life. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. My question for you this morning may be, how do you, how often do you think about the gospel? How often do you think about the gospel, Christian? Just by, just by sheer statistics alone, most of you, most of us come in here on a Sunday morning and we think about God for about an hour and a half. But then we walk out these doors and our life is so busy and so hectic that we don't have time to think about God again unless we have an emergency and need help. That's that's not how it's going to need to work. We're not not going to be able to live the life God has called us to, to live unless we're thinking about God, considering Christ on a daily basis, multiple times throughout the day, focusing on Jesus. Well, how do you do this? How do you do this? We just said it in the scripture. Consider Jesus. This is a sticky part of scripture. So if you haven't listened to anything or if you're just taking a little cat nap, wake back up for a second and come back in. It says right here in verse 2b, it says, for the joy that lay before him, 
He endured the cross. So consider Jesus. The first way that we do this is we consider Christ. We consider Jesus. It says, for the joy set before him. Listen to this this morning. What held Jesus to the cross? It wasn't nails. Because he was God. He could just say, nails be gone. They would just dissolve in thin air. He's God, right? He could do anything. It wasn't God. Nobody killed Jesus. He gave himself up freely for you and me. Do you hear that? That's the gospel. According to verse 2, it was the joy that awaited him on the other side of the cross that he was doing what he was doing. So I asked the question is, what was it that Jesus didn't have before the cross that he did have after the cross? It was the glory of reconciling us back to himself, the gospel. It was the joy set before him. Before the cross, there was no way back to God because of our sin. But when Christ was on the cross, he was thinking about redemption and reconciling us back to himself. And you want to talk about what moves you in your Christian life? It's this. It's the gospel. That's what it is. While Jesus was on the cross, this was on his mind, the, the reconciliation of man, the reconciliation of the creation, the glory that he would receive from the gospel. He loved us so much that he's willing, he willingly went to the cross to buy you back from your sin, from our sin this morning. I pray that we would see that because there's nothing that glorifies God more than reconciling lost, dead people back to himself. I pray that we would... It should. It should draw presence. Doesn't that empower you to give up everything you have? Christ gave himself for you, gave himself up for you so that you can be saved. Doesn't that make you want to give up what you have so that other people can be saved? It has to. When we consider Christ and who he is, God on the cross, it motivates us. But not only Christ, we should be considering the cross. The cross is the part of the gospel. Think about Jesus on the cross, the, the single greatest act of love in human history. There's nothing that has the power to move us more than considering the blood-stained cross of Jesus. That's why we sing about it. That's why we preach about it. That's why we go on mission trips. That's why we have connect groups. That's why we have church to remember the cross and what Christ did on the cross. Because when you come face to face with the cross, we come face to face with the heart of God. Do you see that this morning? We good? What we see is nothing has the power to move you more than the heart of God. Because in the heart of God, we see the depths of his love, his generosity, his service. We see the greatest act of, of forgiveness that has ever been extended before. And when you look at the cross, it doesn't just show us who God is. It shows us who we should be. We learn true humility because it was my sin that put Jesus on the cross. It was my sin that put him there. It was when we learn how to, that's when we learn how to love others unconditionally. When we learn how to serve others sacrificially. When we learn how to live life of generosity. But here's the kicker, guys, that I want you to see this morning. The cross only has the power in your life if you believe that you need it. Do you hear that? The cross will only have power in your life if it becomes personal to you. If you look at Jesus on the cross and it's some foreign cold concept that you've heard a thousand times, that you've been taught your whole life, but it's never become personal, it'll never have power in your life. This morning, I pray that it will become personal. But when you understand how much you need Jesus and how much you need salvation, you'll look at that cross and it'll give you the greatest hope of your life. The third thing we see doesn't stop there. We need to consider the resurrection as we close. The resurrection is the foundation of our faith. It's the one thing that sets us apart from every other religion in the world. The resurrection is the foundation of our faith. The cross, what it does is it shows us God's willingness to save us. But the resurrection shows us his power to do so. Do you see that? So his, the cross is, is God saying, I'm willing to give, to give you new life for reconciliation back to me. The resurrection is saying, I have the power to resurrect my son. I have the power to resurrect your life also. And that's what he's showing you. He's not only willing to save us, but he also has the power to save us. And, and think about the implications of the, of the resurrection on your life personally. Because of the resurrection, you can trust Jesus is who he says he is. 
Because of the resurrection, you can trust that we are who Jesus says that we are. We're, we can be born again. We can be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that rose Jesus from that grave can live inside of his children. We can live our lives with power and victory over sin and death. Guys, there's no greater, there's nothing worth celebrating more than the resurrection. And we, when we consider the gospel in our lives, it changes everything. So we need to permeate our minds, our hearts with it. This is why we need to write it on the walls of our homes, listening to it in our cars, being here on Sunday to hear the gospel, being a group, encouraging one another with it. Because whatever you have to do to consider Christ, to consider the cross, to consider the resurrection every day, you need to do it. You need to figure that out because it fuels, it, it's what fuels and motivates you to run the race. This morning, I, I just know by statistics, many of you guys in this room are running on empty. Many of you guys are running on empty. You just don't know how you're going to keep going like this. Some of you are losing heart as the writer of Hebrews later writes. We're growing weary. Why do you think that is? Why are you tired and weary? Why are you losing heart? Because we've taken our eyes off of Jesus. This morning, I pray that you would see that we've forgotten how much we need him and we put it back on ourselves and our own performance. God, am I doing enough? God, am I, am I good enough? God, no, you're not and you haven't. That's why you need Jesus. This morning, fix your eyes on Jesus and run the race. For many of us in this room, we've never done this. Our whole life has been about trying to add up for God, trying to be a better person, but that's not the gospel. This morning, I want to be clear. The gospel is that God loves you. It's that you are a sinner that deserves to be eternally punished by the wrath of God, but in God's love, he didn't punish you. He punished his, sin, his son instead so that you can have eternal life in him. This morning, is this you? Do you need Jesus this morning? Do you know that you have never entered into a vibrant, alive relationship with God this morning through his son, Jesus? You've been playing the church game. You've been playing the religion game. You've been shining yourself up every week and you've been fine, but maybe never have walked into a relationship with Jesus. This morning, if this is you, I pray that you would take a step and say yes to the free gift of salvation that Jesus is offering you this morning through, through his death, burial, and resurrection. For those of you this morning who are, are a Christian in this place and you, you just need to stop surviving, you need to re-engage. Maybe you need to re-engage with Jesus and his church this morning. I pray that whatever it is, that you would come to this altar and that you would get it right this morning. If you need to come to Christ, if you need prayer, I pray that you would come see one of our prayer team members and just walk up to one of them and say, I don't know what to do, but I know I need Jesus. I know that I need Jesus. And I'm ready to take that step. And so this morning, I pray that you would take that step if that's you. If you're a Christian in this place and you've been living on the outskirts, not giving your life to Christ like you, like you promised him you would, I pray this morning that you would come to this altar and repent and get back on track and let's walk forward together as a body of Christ. Let's re-engage with Jesus this morning. I want to pray for you. And as I pray, you come. God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for what you've done on the cross. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for the cross. God, I pray this morning that you would reignite our faith. I pray that you would just bring us back into a red-hot relationship with you, Jesus, not only as individuals, but also as a church. God, I pray for the person in this room who has been playing games. I pray that you would wake them up this morning. I pray that you would just speak to their hearts. God, I pray for the person in this room that does not know you. I pray that you would reveal that to them, Father, and draw them to yourself this morning. God, I pray that you would receive glory, adoration, honor, and praise this morning from your people. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.